cold and drizzly and rainy out today, so it's making me feel rather philosophical. <laughs> I started thinking about ideas for the blog post this week, and I was thinking I'd write about training, something about training cycles and training philosophy, kind of in that vein. And it got me thinking a little bit, and I don't think I'd ever actually really sat down to write this out in a long form article. And that's something I spent a lot of time thinking about, but, but it's the difference between training cycles, how personal trainers and kind of the functional fitness world approaches stuff versus how your typical endurance athlete approaches training cycles. So most of us endurance athletes, uh, it's real common to start with the race we signed up for and work our way backwards. And as we go through the training block, it goes from kind of general conditioning to getting faster and faster and faster, more volume, more intensity, and ideally we peak on race day. But the concept is you build the training block by starting on race day and building backwards. And hopefully you start the training block far enough from race day that you have enough time to get the whole thing in. Uh, and not everybody does that. But, the alternative approach that a lot of personal trainers and functional fitness folks use is kind of like a six to eight week training cycle that's focused on one or two kind of key things, typically the weakest link in the chain for whatever you know the, the athlete or client is wanting to address. And, uh, and then you finish up that six to eight weeks and after six or eight weeks of working on something, you start getting diminishing returns. And so you switch gears and you start working on the next weakest link in the chain or the next, the next adaptation kind of response you're looking for that makes sense given what you just did. So that your cycles kind of build on each other. And over time, you end up more fit a year from now than you are today. And so fundamentally, there are two different approaches to trying to get fitter. One, you start with where you want to go and you work your way backwards. And the other one, you start with where you currently are and continuously evolve it as you go forward to fit your needs. Now obviously, if you start with your typical endurance training plan where you're starting at race day and working your way backwards, then what you have going on is ideally you should be reaching a kind of physical fitness performance peak on race day. And it has a base, base consumption. You might have a some wiggle room kind of built into the training block, you know, to account for getting sick because that's going to happen if you have kids in public school or you interact with other people or anything, you know, something's going to happen that's going to cause you to not be able to train for a week, whether it's getting sick or traveling or the holidays. Typically our training cycles for major endurance races are not short. You know, it's not uncommon for them to be 12, 16, 20, 24 weeks long. Um, and having everything click for that entire duration uh, is amazing when it happens. But real life is a thing, and it happens. So a good training plan kind of takes that into account. and builds a week in there to kind of account for that. But it still has some basic assumptions um, that after, you know, assuming you start at the right time, and you meet all the basic assumptions of being in basic, general, good health and fitness when you start, that you're going to respond to training at a planned rate. So you'll, after your first chunk of training, depending on what you're doing, whether it's base building or it's working on some speed and technique stuff, uh, you know, it's the, there's an assumption that you're going to respond to training in a given way and you're going to come out of that first four to six weeks of the training cycle at a given point. And then that informs like the next few weeks, theoretically, um, of what's going on. But most of us still go, well, we want to run this time on this day. So that means at this point in the training block, I need to be doing this workout 
at this point in the training block, I need to be doing this workout at these paces. And it fails to account for what kind of fitness we're in at the beginning. Unless we start one of these training cycles right after we finish the race and we know exactly where our fitness is at. And that's kind of the common approach most endurance athletes take. Uh, you know, we get done with our big race, we might take a week or two off, goof off, go to the beach, go on vacation, take our well-earned vacation because we're beat up and fried and hopefully we take some time off so we don't get hurt. Uh, and we recover from our race. And then we dive right into training again for the next one that's 12 to 16 to 20 to 24 weeks away. And that can happen. Uh, it can lead to good results, but those training blocks, those training cycles, that approach is really geared towards that key race, the race at the end of the training block. It's not really geared for longer term than that. And 24 weeks can be a long time, but it's not next year or two years from now or five years from now down the road. We want, it's looking at how close to my theoretical maximal potential can I get now. And in the grand scheme of things, it's rather short-sighted, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of us runners, a lot of us endurance athletes, runners and triathletes, get hurt. Because we spend a lot of time doing essentially the same kind of training, and there's only so many hours in the week, there's only so much workload we can handle uh, without getting hurt. And a lot of our training is geared towards making us as fit as possible on race day you know, 12, 16, 20, 20 weeks from now. Whereas the other approach, this kind of functional fitness, personal trainer side of things, and we kind of did this at the Kung Fu school back in the day too. It was a little bit different because it's mastery based. But that concept of whatever the weak link in the chain is, whether it's your aerobic base, or your aerobic capacity, or your speed, or your biomechanics, your efficiency, your skill at running, Whatever that weakest link is, you're going to get more return for the amount of time you spend training if you work on that than if you work on something else, even if it's not the key component for your primary event. And this is the this this, fundament, this fundamentally uses that longer term view of where we're trying to get our fitness to go. And it's something I don't think a lot of endurance athletes actually think about. Uh, you know, we spend a lot, I get a lot of phone calls from people being like, hey, I'm registered for this marathon, you know, 16 or 20 or 24 weeks ago, or hey, I'm registered for this, I'm registered for this try three months from now, or I want to run this 5k three months from now. Uh, and it's very goal oriented, which is good. We should have goals. They help inform training. But they Oftentimes, we miss that bigger picture of continual development and injury prevention. And most endurance athletes I know want to be able to keep doing it over a long time. We do it because we like doing it. And getting hurt sucks. And most endurance athletes are going to suffer some kind of injury on any given year. Something like 80% of runners get an injury, an overuse injury, every year. And it can be IT band syndrome. It can be, you know, shin splints. It can be strains, and the whole, there's a whole host of different overuse injuries we suffer, but fundamentally overuse injuries are preventable. You know, we get them because we're greedy and uh, we reach too far. And part of the reason we get them is because we're missing just that general fitness that keeps us healthy. You know, we're, we're missing that chunk of the training block where we're working on just being generally fit and healthy people. Uh, you know, we're missing that part where we're working on range of motion, functional range of motion, being able to actually apply force with a stable core through a whole range of motion. So we end up with a lot of runners with tight hamstrings, tight hips. We get a lot of, uh, get a lot of cycling, you know, a lot of triathletes and cyclists with tight hip flexors and tight hamstrings because they use a short range of motion all the time and they don't do anything else. And I'm guilty of it. I'll admit it. Uh, you know, I've spent five years chasing my Boston qualifier. I finally nailed it. And I, but the difference was I knew that eventually the butcher's bill would come and I was right on the line and I made the 
intentional choice to push that red line and see if I could get there. Not every race should be that big pie in the sky goal race. And that's why we get her. Instead, if we have this other training philosophy where we go working on, you know, whatever the weak link in the chain is, you know, for most folks, if they first come to me, they're normally, statistically speaking, the things we're normally missing out on are core stability and running technique. And so they're probably going to spend a couple weeks working on that primarily. So the majority of our miles are still going to be kind of easy paced miles. We're not trying to beat you up because you got to have that good aerobic capacity to run, you know. Um, but typically, most most athletes I see, when they first come to me, they've been pushing too hard for their easy miles. They lack core stability and range of motion in the hips, and they really need to work on their running technique. Uh, and that's okay. You know, that's why they come see me is because they got hurt or they really want to do well at this race that they registered for sometime down the road. And so they want to get serious about training. Uh, so if they're, that's the first thing they're doing, most of us don't spend, a, most of us that have been endurance athletes for a while, we don't spend a lot of time doing dedicated technique training. We might do some drills here and there while we're warming up. Uh, we might do some striders a couple times a week. We might, uh, you know, we might do some dedicated speed work every here and there, especially if we got some 5Ks coming up. But we don't spend like a dedicated six to eight weeks really stressing that neuromuscular system, working on the ability to stay coordinated and recruit lots of muscle fibers all at once, and re really working on improving our forward lean and landing under our hip and all the things that go into making us biomechanically efficient athletes. Um, so I think maybe maybe there would be something to be gained from that. Uh, and so I was just kind of ruminating on these thoughts a little bit while I was kind of putting together the nuts and bolts for this the blog post on Friday. And uh, yeah, I want to know all your thoughts. What do you think? Are you guilty of... Uh, are, you, are you guilty of... You know, constantly being focused on the A race, since a lot of endurance athletes, myself included, tend to be goal-oriented and motivated competitive individuals. Or do you actually take the time to kind of sit back and over the course of a year do some speed training, do some technique training, do some aerobic power training, do some base building, do some lifting, hit the pool, ride a bike, do the stuff that keeps you physically fit and healthy in general. Because, um, yeah. Getting, getting hurt sucks, and uh, you know, doesn't doesn't do you any good to be able to run your A race and then but then have to retire because you broke something. So let me know let me know what you think. Thoughts, comments. If this is something that interests you, hit that subscribe button down below. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. I'd love to love to hear your guys' response to this. I'd be real curious to know if you've put some thought into this and kind of how you tackle these approaches to your own training. Uh, yeah, so let me know. Train smart, guys.